Well, maybe you remember that scene uh, from the blockbuster movie The Blind Side. In the scene, the Tui family is crammed around the television on Thanksgiving Day, enjoying a store-bought meal. Their new house guest, Michael Orr, a foster kid at the local school they found walking the streets at night, is overwhelmed by the experience. The food, the house, the love. Stuffing rolls into his pockets, he sits down at the table in the dining room alone to eat his dinner, and this is the moment that Leanne Tui, played, played by Sandra Bullock, realizes they are doing Thanksgiving all wrong. It occurs to her how much they have to be grateful for and how they've been taking their blessings for granted. So she gathers the family together for a proper Thanksgiving meal. This is the purpose of Thanksgiving, of course. It's on Thanksgiving that we count our blessings because we, too, have much to be grateful for. Warm homes, good-paying jobs, jobs uh, food security, uh, not everyone enjoys those blessings. Thanksgiving should remind us of that, too. This Thanksgiving, for example, 50 million Americans, including 17 million children, don't have enough food to eat. This Thanksgiving, 567,715 people are homeless on the streets. 400,000 children spent this Thanksgiving in foster care. Over 40 million Americans are on food stamps this Thanksgiving. This Thanksgiving, over 11 million Americans who want to work uh, don't have a job. So yeah, Thanksgiving is a time for thanks, but it should also be a time for action. How can we be grateful for our blessings and not bless others who have less? Is it even possible to enjoy our large Thanksgiving meal knowing that millions of people in our own country don't have enough food to eat? I don't ask these questions as some social activist intent on ruining your holiday weekend with guilt this morning. I just ask these questions to you as someone who has been reading the book of Isaiah a lot lately. We're studying the book of Isaiah here at Rooftop in an extended study. Uh, Isaiah was a Jewish prophet in the 8th century before Christ. And God had charged the people of Judah to be a holy nation, but they had failed him time and time and time again. God sent prophets to warn them that they better clean up the act, their act, but they didn't. So God descends to send them one final prophet to announce their coming destruction. This man's name was Isaiah. And he leaves behind a big, beautiful book of prophetic poetry in the Old Testament. Now, the book of Isaiah is big and complicated, so we've broken it up into seven mini-series. Uh, this third mini-series is called The Lord Is. In the book of Isaiah, we learn a lot about God's character, who he is, what he is like. He is sovereign. He is compassionate. He is zealous. All topics that we're going to discuss but this morning, we're going to study something else we learned from Isaiah about God's character. We learn that God is righteous, and we learn that God is just. The words righteous and just appear in the book of Isaiah dozens of times to describe who God is, but very frequently, you hear these words together, like in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 16, the Lord Almighty will be exalted by his justice, and the holy God will show himself holy by his righteousness. And in chapter 11, with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. And in chapter 33, the Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and with righteousness. Very commonly in the Bible, these two words appear together, righteousness and justice. Now, why is this? Well, it's because they have very related meanings. Hebrew scholars actually tell us that they're very similar words. In fact, if you came this morning for some graduate level Bible study, anybody here for some graduate level Bible study? Woo! You're gonna get some graduate level Bible study this morning, whether or not you want it. I'm gonna cram it down your throats. Not really, it's way too graphic. So if you didn't know, the Old Testament was not written in English. What language is the Old Testament written in? Hebrew. And the Hebrew word for justice in the Old Testament is the word mishpat. Turn to your neighbor and say mishpat. <laughs> and the most common word for righteousness in Hebrew is the word tzed uh, tzedakah. It's a little harder. Tzedakah. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say tzedakah. You've got to get the T and the Z right, right at the beginning. Tzedakah. Uh, these are two very, very important words in the Hebrew Bible, and their meaning can be very difficult to pin down because Hebrew is a lot more colorful and nuanced a language than English is. But in English, mishpat, or, or justice, commonly translated justice, to be more specific, is a condition in which people are given what is rightfully theirs, either punishment or protection. 
Uh, Mishpat is when injustices are fixed, when the poor are lifted up, when criminals are punished. Now, tzedakah, or righteousness, is different than what you think it means. When we think of righteousness, we usually think of personal holiness. We think of people who live morally upright lives, you know, people who pray a lot and who don't cuss and uh, who don't smoke. You know, they're so righteous. That's usually what we think of. Or we think of surfing turtles who scream, righteous, righteous, while, read, while riding the East Australian current. Anybody remember Finding Nemo? Has it been that long? Remember Crush? Righteous, righteous, dude, dude. But that's not what sadaka means. Sadaka doesn't mean personal holiness. It means relational holiness. It means social holiness. Sadaka means a condition in which people live in right relationship to others through generosity and fairness. To be righteous is to do right by other people. So mishpat is to give people what is rightfully theirs, and tzedakah is to live in right relationship with others. Bible scholar and New York City pastor Tim Keller writes that we can understand these two words this way. Tzedakah, or righteousness, might refer to primary justice. Primary justice is just living primarily, generously, and fairly. And mishpat, or justice, is rectifying justice. Rectifying justice is fixing injustices. So, if everybody lives with tzedakah, primary justice, if everybody treats one another with uh, fairness and generosity, there's no need for mishpat or rectifying justice. If the founding fathers of America had decided that slavery and racism were wrong in the 17th and 18th centuries, if they had practiced tzedakah, there'd be less need for the civil rights movement for mishpat today. If women hadn't been discriminated against and been denied equal protection by the law, Tzedakah, there'd be no need for mishpat. If America's indigenous people had been treated fairly with tzedakah, there'd be no need for mishpat. So these two words, tzedakah, mishpat, are actually really important ones to God in the Bible. They always have been. When when God founded Israel as a new nation, he told his people that this country he wanted to establish would be a place of righteousness and justice. He made this very clear to Abraham, the founding father of Israel. Way, way back in Genesis 18, God tells Abraham, I have chosen you to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Tzedakah and Mishpat. So that the Lord will bring about what he has promised. The Old Testament law itself was to be a legal and moral code to ensure that God's people would be a nation of righteousness and justice. That was one of the purposes of the law, to ensure fairness for the vulnerable. In fact, with righteousness and with justice as their two guiding stars, God's vision for Israel was that it would be a nation, get this, with no poor people, no oppressed people, no vulnerable people, no hungry people, That was the vision. As he tells them in Deuteronomy, there should be no poor among you. There should be no poor among you. Now, how could that be possible? To have no poor among them? It was possible if they followed the law and practiced tzedakah and mishpat. That was the vision, at least. Now, Israel had some good runs over the years, but eventually God's vision was lost on them. The nation deteriorated into greed and oppression. Women and widows were taken advantage of. The rich oppressed the poor. Uh, Immigrants were abused. Children were ignored. When God shows up in Isaiah chapter 5 to inspect his people, the prophet writes that he looked for justice, mishpat. He saw bloodshed. For tzedakah, but he heard cries of distress. And as Isaiah writes in chapter 1, see how the faithful city has become a harlot. She was once so full of justice, mishpat, tzedakah used to dwell in her, but now murderers. This is why the nation of Judah is being judged. This is why God has sent Isaiah to announce destruction, because they have forgotten who God is and what he cares about. He cares about righteousness. He cares about justice for the oppressed. He cares because it's who he is. He is tzedakah. He is mishpat. In fact, even with the destruction of Judah, God has not given up on his vision to create a just and fair society. Righteousness and justice are too close to his heart. The book of Isaiah describes God's judgment on a nation that had abandoned its calling, but it also describes God's vision for a new nation 
where justice and righteousness would rule. Even as the capital city of Jerusalem is being destroyed, God lays out a plan to build a new nation with a new city, as he says in chapter 28. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. Justice and righteousness will be like the founding principles of this new country. And in this city, there will be a throne on which will sit a king, and not just any old king, a righteous king, a just king, as he writes in chapter 16. In love, a throne will be established. In faithfulness, a man will sit on it, one from the house of David, one who in judging seeks justice and speeds the cause of righteousness. And earlier in chapter 9, this king will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness forever. Mishpat and Tzedakah. Now we know who this king is, right? This king is the Messiah. This king is Jesus Christ, who came to rule the church and eventually the whole earth in righteousness and justice. Eight centuries after Isaiah's prophecy, Jesus came to sit on that throne He's preparing to build a kingdom where justice is the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line, where there are no poor among us, where everybody gets what they deserve. Those who take advantage of the weak are punished and the weak and the vulnerable lifted up. Even now, he is building that new nation in the church. He's building that new nation, that place of righteousness and justice. He's building it in us. And Isaiah assures us that the Messiah's just and righteous reign will eventually arrive. As he writes in chapter 32, see A king will reign in righteousness, and rulers will rule with justice. So that's your graduate level Bible study on Mishpat and Tzedakah in the book of Isaiah. Good job for sticking with it. For all that new knowledge I've just imparted to you, though, it does lead to the next obvious question. Hopefully you know me by now to know what the next question is. What's the next question? So what? Who cares? What does this all mean for us? What do we do now? Well, Isaiah tells us that too. Towards the very end of the book, the prophet writes, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Maintain justice, do what is right. Maintain justice, do righteousness, for my salvation is close at hand. Because God is a God of Mishpat and Sadaka, we should be people of Mishpat and Sadaka. But let's talk more practically. What does that look like specifically to maintain justice and do righteousness? Well, remember I told you that these two words, mishpat and tzedakah, are very often, uh, are very important in the Bible. Very, very often they, they appear together. It's, it's very, you, you usually read them together, and it's weird to kind of see them alone. Uh, they're like twins, twin words. You usually see them together, it's kind of weird to see them alone. They're each different, like twins are different, but they're also very, very similar and need to be seen together. We actually have a couple deacons here at Rooftop who are twins, Keith and Kevin Pruitt. Uh, turn to your neighbor and say, Keith and Kevin Pruitt. You didn't turn to your neighbor and say, Keith and Kevin Pruitt. Kevin's over there. Is that Keith or Kevin over there? Turn that way and just say, hey, Keith and Kevin Pruitt. Uh, Keith and Kevin are both different, but they're both similar. You rarely see them apart, and when you do see them apart, you get confused about who it is. Uh, Same thing with Mishpat and Tzedakah. They're different from each other, but similar. And you usually see them together. In fact, some scholars think that you should actually interpret these words together as one phrase. And when you interpret them together, you get something that might help us know what to do here. Uh, N.T. Wright, a well-known Bible scholar, is one of several experts who say that the best way to translate mishpat and tzedakah together today is as the phrase social justice. Mishpat and tzedakah together mean social justice. I actually think this makes sense. Remember that tzedakah is the Hebrew word for treating people fairly in community, doing right by others. Mishpat is giving people what they are due, rectifying wrongs. That's what social justice is, fairness on our communities and the redressing of wrongs. Now, I know that some of you probably rankled when I even said the phrase social justice. It's a complicated, controversial phrase. Who knows what went through your mind when I said it? You might have thought progressive politics. 
You might think of George Floyd or Breonna Taylor. You might think of the redistribution of wealth. You might think of defunding the police. You might think of socialism. You might think about your friends on Facebook who are so-called social justice warriors and just won't shut up about stuff. They keep going on and on and on about our world's problems. Unfollow. Who knows what comes to your mind? The phrase is a big one that is claimed by so many groups of people that it can practically mean anything these days. Which is why we have to be really specific when we use it. However other people in our world use the phrase social justice, when Christians use the term, we should use it differently. Christian social justice is very different from other more secular versions of social justice out there. How is it different? Well, when most Christians talk about social justice, we're not talking about some state-sponsored secular utopia. We're not talking about building a politically correct culture where criminals are released from prison and people are thrown in jail for microaggressions. Nor am I talking about some temporary social media fad where we all suddenly care about racism and poverty because it looks cool. That's not what I'm talking about. And for the record, on that point, God cared about social justice much earlier than anybody else did. No, I'm not talking about communism. I'm not talking about social media fads. When Christians talk about social justice, we're talking about people caring for others because we were created in the image of God. We're talking about a place where it's no disadvantage to be black or white or brown or female or male or disabled or young or old. We're talking about a place where the rich are motivated to share their wealth with the disadvantaged because it is the right and the just thing to do. And most importantly, we're talking about what it looks like to follow the example and the leadership of Jesus, who is the image of God on earth. Jesus is walking, talking mishpat. Jesus is tzedakah in the flesh. So I'm not casting the social justice vision for you because I'm some progressive pastor and Christian hippie. Don't let the long hair fool you here. I'm just cheap. I'm a fiscal conservative. I don't want to waste money on haircuts. I'm casting this vision for you because the Bible does. Because Isaiah does. I'm telling you that we should care about social justice properly understood because God does. It's who he is. Back to our question, though, what can we do? What can we do to help realize God's vision for earth as a place of tzedakah and mishpat? Well, here are some things. First, we can research social justice. Uh, maybe you're not on the social justice train. You think that for the most part, the poor create their own problems. You think that racism is exaggerated by the media? You think that the majority of homeless are lazy alcoholics? You think that social justice is a rhetorical cover word for communism? I get it. You might be right. What I'm humbly asking, though, is for you to learn more. Because you might be wrong. Turn off cable news and do some research. Uh, try a book, reading a book. Novel notion these days. Read a book with someone you disagree with. That's usually the missing, odd, uh, missing ingredient. Expose yourself to views other than your own. Uh, try Tim Keller's book, Generous Justice. How God's grace makes us just. Or read anything by John Perkins, including Let Justice Roll Down. Open yourself to, to the possibility that you don't know as much as you think you do and that you have much to learn about God as righteous and just. As Isaiah writes in chapter 1, learn to do right. Learn what it means to do right. Research social justice. Learn more. Also, pray for social justice. Jesus instructs us in Matthew 5 to pray, our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For some reason, prayer is part of God's plan to bring justice from heaven to earth. Now why? With so many people dying of starvation and racial violence, why are we wasting time in our closets praying? Well, because whatever we think, we can't do much of anything without God. Uh, President John F. Kennedy said quite famously that because our problems are created by man, 
They can be solved by man. Forgive me, what a load of crap. I mean, the more we try to fix stuff, the more we just muck it up. We need God's help here. Don't feel bad starting with prayer. Pray for Mishpat. Pray for Tzedakah. If you're not sure what to pray for, pray for our upcoming Mexico trip. We've got 30 people going to Mexico next month to build a home for the homeless in Reynosa. We do it twice a year. But with the coronavirus, this trip is going to be much more complicated this time. Pray for us. Pray for the families that we're going to be building for. Pray that it goes well. Pray for justice. Those families that we're building for, they did nothing to earn their poverty except happen to be born in a border town. That's not fair. Pray for us that we can show them a modicum of mishpat, a taste of tzedakah. They deserve to see it. Also, vote for social justice. You might not believe me, but voting matters. Elections matter. To be sure, I am not, hear me very, very clearly. Please hear me very, very clearly. I am not telling you to vote for a certain political party. Faith and justice transcend party affiliation. They at least should. I mean, some of the most compassionate people I know are Republicans. Some of the most selfish people I know are liberals. Some of the most godless people I know are conservatives. Some of the most Christian-minded people are Democrats, and vice versa all over the place. I'm telling you, though, that the people we vote for set the moral course for our nation. Voting matters. And I'm telling you more to the point that when you vote, keep in mind the oppressed members of our society. Let's be honest, most of us don't vote that way. We vote for our own interests. If we're honest, most of us vote for whichever candidate promises to put more money in our pockets. That's not right. We can start here just by learning, by learning what candidates think about social justice issues. What is your favorite candidate? Think is the best way to lower the abortion rate. Lower the poverty rate, bolster the foster care system, increase job opportunity, help immigrants, expand health care coverage. Do you ask those questions? Do you even care? Whatever party you affiliate with, bump those issues up in your priority list. Vote with social justice in mind. Also, practice social justice. Voting is one thing, but it, admittedly, it, it's, a, it's a small little thing. It's almost a little too easy sometimes. What Isaiah is pleading for is, is action. He's telling us to do something. As he's already said, maintain justice. Do what is right. Do righteousness. And don't waste too much time looking for perfect opportunities either. We are surrounded by opportunities to treat people with justice and righteousness. A few years ago, for example, I was leading a Bible study small group on the book of James. And a friend of mine named Chuck was in the small group. And we got to this verse in chapter 1 that says, Religion that God our Father accepts and pure and faultless is this. Two, look after orphans and widows in their distress. True religion. Looking after orphans and widows. My friend Chuck admitted that he didn't even know any widows or orphans, let alone look after them. So Chuck's a fairly obedient guy. He went out and he found himself a widow. He lived in an apartment complex. Right across the hallway from him was an elderly woman, marched right up to her door and introduced himself. Her name was Miss Carolyn Tosh. She turned out to be a very sweet, feisty woman. She wasn't necessarily in distress, but she was lonely. She was something of a lapsed Christian, so he asked her if she wanted to study the Bible together. She said she did. They met twice a week. Uh, for a couple hours at a time, for several years, and just read through the Bible. They got through the Bible like two and a half times. He asked her if she wanted to come to church, and she did. He brought her to church. For several years, she would grab some earplugs on the way in. Eventually, she admitted she had never been baptized. So six or seven years ago, Chuck and I baptized a 90-year-old elderly woman, making sure not to break her in the process. Chuck stayed in contact with her till the end her death a few years back. 
My point is that when it comes to social justice, you don't have to protest at a parade, although you can. You don't have to start a movement, although you can. You don't have to post anything on social media, although you can. You just have to find someone who doesn't have all the advantages in life than you do, and they are all around us. Who are they? Well, there are typically four groups of people that the Bible says we should be especially concerned for. Nicholas Wolterstorff is a professor of philosophy at Yale, And he calls this group of people the quartet of the vulnerable. The quartet of the vulnerable of the vulnerable are listed in the prophet Zechariah in the Old Testament. This is what the Lord Almighty said. Administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. That's the quartet of the vulnerable. The widow, the orphan, the immigrant, and the poor. Why these four? Because in the ancient world, they had the least economic and social power. They were the most vulnerable to oppression, to war, to natural disaster. When times got tough, they were the first to die. The widow, the orphan, the immigrant, the poor. Now, honestly, we have made progress in building economic and social systems that care for these people. But before we congratulate ourselves too much, remember, they're still here. We are still surrounded by opportunities to care for the less fortunate. As I said, over 500,000 Americans slept on the streets this Thanksgiving. 400,000 are in foster care. There are still plenty to do. If you don't know what to do, just look around you. Maybe start by looking across the hallway. Practice social justice. And lastly, model social justice. I'm speaking now to Christians as the church, as the people of God. You see, we will never be able to eradicate social injustice in the world here on earth. Uh, Poverty is too intractable. Sin is too deeply rooted. uh, The need is too great. That's just going to have to wait until Jesus returns in all his glory to set everything aright, which will happen. So we're never going to be able to eradicate poverty here on earth. But we can maybe set the example for what it should look like. The church has been doing this forever, setting setting the example. The book of Acts, for example, is the story of the early church in the New Testament. As Luke describes the first Christians in Acts, he writes this. He says, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. So in describing the early church, Luke picks up this theme from the Old Testament that there should be no poor among us. What righteousness and justice can look like. That's what he writes. There were no poor, needy persons among them. He is highlighting this reality as the fulfillment of God's promise to build a people of justice and righteousness. God's vision for his people in the Old Testament is finally realized in his people in the New Testament. And that's our opportunity too. We are God's Israel. We are his Judah. It is our opportunity to show the world how to care for each other. And we're committed to that too. Here at Rooftop, we have a benevolence team that has money available to give to rooftoppers in need. I've told you this before. I'll tell you again. If Rooftop is your church home, please know for a fact we won't let you go hungry. We won't let you go homeless if Rooftop is your church home. And even if Rooftop isn't your church home, we'll still do our best. As Paul writes to the Galatians, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people especially to those who belong to the family of believers. We're here for your good. Now we have expectations, we have a process, you're going to have to cooperate, but we want to help. And if you're not in need, this is why we are not embarrassed at all to challenge you guys to give too. 
Because you might not have time, but you might have money, and that counts. Your tithes, your offerings, go to Mishpat and Sadaka in our church, in our community. We support organizations here that help immigrants. We support the food pantry. We support orphan care. That's where a portion of your money goes. We're doing our best to model what Mishpat and Sadaka can look like. Why, why are we doing this? To show off? No, not to earn our way into heaven. We're doing this because we are commanded by God to do so. We're doing this because all people have been created in the image of God, and whatever we do for the least of these, we do for Christ. And we're doing this because in the same way God has showed his grace to us, we want to show his grace to others. And we see this in Acts also. In the passage I just read to you, Luke, the author, tucks in this little sentence in the middle that's important. He writes, With great power the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Much grace was upon them all. There are no needy persons among them. Much grace is upon them all. Our generosity, our compassion, our mishpat, our tzedakah don't come from us. They are symbols of God's grace. What's God's grace? God's grace is his undeserved love, his unearned favor. We don't deserve God's grace. We didn't earn God's grace. We don't deserve what Jesus did for us on the cross. We don't deserve the Holy Spirit who gives us life and power and joy. We are selfish and greedy. But God loves us anyway. God invaded our world, called us into a new community, a new Judah, to show us what true mishpat and tzedakah look like so that we can show the world what it looks like. So, people of Rooftop, Thanksgiving reminds us that we are so blessed by God, but it also reminds us how we take these things for granted. We crowd around our TV screens on Thanksgiving, we stuff our faces and we forget. We forget that there are orphans on the streets. We forget that people are dying from exposure. We forget of the immigrants who have nowhere to go. How can we celebrate Thanksgiving, really, when we are surrounded by such profound need? If you want to show God that you are grateful for your blessings, care what God cares about. Show the world who the Lord is. Show the world his mishpat, his tzedakah, and do it today. The time is short. Remember what the prophet has said. Maintain justice do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand. The Lord is coming to judge us as he came to judge Judah. What will he find us doing when he gets here? Crowding around the TV, taking our blessings for granted, or sitting down to dinner at the table with the orphan, with the widow, with the immigrant, with the poor. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Bible study. That when we dig into your word, we learn who you are. We learn what you care about. And we learn this morning from your prophet that you are righteous and you are just. And it doesn't necessarily mean what we think it means. means usually, as it usually does, means more. It means that you are fair and compassionate and considerate. You know that most people born on planet Earth aren't born with a fair shot. They weren't born into the richest country in the history of the world. And that bothers you. <laughs> And you created a nation that could do something about it. They didn't, at least as much as you called them to. And we're that new nation now. We're your people. We're your Judah. We're your Israel. We're the church. Help us be a model of mishpat and tzedakah. Social justice when properly understood. A place that cares for each other and shares your grace and your provision with people who aren't so blessed. A place filled with people that engages the world, doesn't hide from it, but steps out into the streets, into the darkness, to share our blessings. Not just food, not just money, but the blessing of Jesus Christ, the blessing of salvation that is available to all who believe and repent. 
Thank you for giving us the opportunity to meet here today in these strange times, whether we're online or here in person. As we enter a strange holiday season, let us be looking for opportunities uh, for justice and righteousness. A lot of us are stuck at home, but there are still opportunities to serve, to pray, to be fair and righteous and just. You didn't stay stuck at home in heaven when you saw our profound need. No, you came down to earth to serve us, to wash our feet, to die for our sins. Help us serve others in obedience to you. Pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.